I think the timeline. So basically, the timeline here is that uh, the GSAT will request, and then we need to have the documents filed. So currently, you have to maintain the documents in terms of master file and local files. On the CBCR, again, a threshold has been defined, and the threshold is uh, Saudi Rial, 3.2 billion, which is equivalent to USD 850 million. Now, if we look at what the OECD when they they uh, uh, the OECD when they said that okay, the CBCR uh, reporting requirements has to be applicable to large multinational companies because they didn't want to burden the small companies with this type of documentation requirement. So what they had put in is that. Oh, Ashish, thank you for this, that uh, GSAT is now ZATCA. Thank you for pointing that out. So what the GST has, uh, what, what the OECD has uh, had uh, put across is that we should have a threshold and the threshold they had defined was 750 million euros and it was equivalent to 850 million uh, dollars at that point of time. I believe it's the same threshold that, that has been put here. In terms of the notification, so I think CBC reporting has been uh, looked in UAE as well, that there are two stages. One is a notification and one is the actual filing of the CBC report. Now here, the notification and what I have tried giving here is that suppose if there is an Indian constituent entity in KSA, operating in KSA, they just need to file a notification and the notification needs to be filed twice. One, when they are filing the disclosure form and then an online filing in the ZATCA, AEOI portal. Because I think one important point that needs to be noted here is that uh, countries have been having this exchange of information uh, programs. And if that has been uh, activated, then this becomes easier for governments to access. So this is a, a information exchange between governments in terms of the CBCR report. So that is something which the OECD has been encouraging that let the governments uh, say, suppose if there is something of a Indian headquartered uh, company CBCR filed in India and if somebody in the UAE or somebody in the Middle East wants then if that say in the current example case if somebody wants it then they can just have the uh, if the program is activated the governments can immediately transfer the relevant uh, filing to KSA again 12 months is the timeline I think what we've seen even in terms of uh, EP controversy is that the uh, ZATCA has been very actively requesting inbound companies. Now here, it is applicable to both inbound as well as outbound companies, right? So here they have been actually uh, requesting uh, inbound companies to file their local file as well as the group master file. In terms of uh, what we have seen till that is that loss making companies is a key concern for ZATCA and they have been, or companies with low profitability. So they have been actually asking uh, questions, picking them up for audits, etc. Now in audits also, uh, generally even in India, we have seen this, uh, that uh, uh, low profit companies or companies into losses, etc. Are, are always in the radar of the authorities. And I have taken those in terms of what are the key risks and areas, what we have seen uh, in my ensuing slides. Even the mutual agreement procedure program has been activated so uh, if, there is, if there is an adjustment at one end, a uh, taxpayer can resort to a mutual agreement procedure program. And uh, the treaty between India and KSA in the current example will be, so will be looked into in terms of the timeline uh, for a filing of the mutual agreement procedure. So it's a, it's a defined timeline and I have to file within that timeline to avail the benefit. The idea is that there should not be any double taxation. We can move to the next slide. Right. Again, in, in, in Qatar as well, I think, uh, you know, they have given a transfer pricing form or a questionnaire again, a master file, local file and a CBCR. Now, again, in Qatar, what we have seen is that primarily the CBCR report focuses on Qatari headquartered groups only for the time being. That might change similar to UAE. Uh, I'm, I'm not getting into the details in terms of the uh, thresholds, etc., which have been prescribed. Uh, one important thing here is that English uh, is accepted as a language for the purposes of uh, the filing. However, the authorities may uh, require a report which is translated into Arabic as well. 
I think we can we can move to the next slide. Right. So now coming to Egypt. Now Egypt again, uh, they have defined thresholds in terms of say if your transaction value is eight million Egyptian pounds, then there is this applicability of the a master file and local file. One, one important distinction that while Egypt follows the OECD approach uh, for uh, the purposes of master file and local file, I think one important exception is that they say that we have a four-step approach and a regional benchmarking requirement. Now, what is this four-step approach? Uh, they say that uh, we need to, in order to price a control transaction or a related party transaction, uh, according to the arms length principle, we need to identify and co identify control transactions and understand the nature of such transactions. This is that four. Uh, this is the a four-step approach which the Egyptian authorities have been advocating. Select the most appropriate method, applying the selected pricing methods, and then determining the arms length price and introducing a review process to reflect any future changes. So I think so this is something which they say that, okay, you should pass this funnel for the purposes of our transfer pricing regulations. Timelines is something which is self-explanatory. I'm not getting into it. On the CBCR, I think uh, this is a typical requirement in terms of the threshold. So for inbound companies, so companies headquartered outside Egypt, but having subsidiaries, they say that, okay, we will have a threshold of group revenue of 750 million euros, which is in line with the OECD. But for outbound companies, so say companies headquartered in Egypt, having subsidiaries outside, they have a much lower threshold. So this is something where they say that the threshold of 3 billion Egyptian pound, which broadly, which is equivalent to uh, euros 145 million. So which is a much lower threshold as compared to the normally seen threshold of 750 million euros. Again, timeline is something which is uh, written. I will not get into it, but one important point about Egypt is that penalties have been advocated and those penalties are really stringent in terms of the number. So oh, the maximum penalty can range up to almost 3% of the value of international transaction, which is unlike other jurisdictions where penalties have been prescribed, but they are not that very stringent. Coming to the next slide. I think Oman again. So in terms of Oman, they only have a CBC uh, reporting requirement. They don't have any other requirements as such. What, what it states is that it focuses on Oman headquartered groups only. So again, only outbound companies, it doesn't include inbound companies. They have put a threshold of 300 million Omani real. So that is something for the purposes of applicability. The CBC requirements are basically I think starting from 1st January, 2020. So last year was the first year for the applicability of CBCR. Timeline has been prescribed, which is I think broadly in line with the expected timelines. We can move to the next slide. Now, here are the departures that we have seen from the broad TP guidelines. Uh, I think two countries where we see that, okay, they have, there has been departure. One is Egypt and one is KSA. So see the departure is that here in terms of uh, the comparability analysis that we have in transfer pricing where we try finding comparable companies. What the Egyptian authorities say is that their first preference is for local Egyptian companies only. Now, this is something which uh, we have seen in some other jurisdictions as well. So even in India, while it is not mentioned in the law. Law only states about comparability, but when, when we interact with the Indian transfer pricing authorities as well, they have a very strong preference for local comparables. So that's the, uh, that's the commonality between India and Egypt in terms of the preference for local comparables. If you are not able to find companies in the local databases, then you might want to expand it to region. And even if, say, you are not able to get something in the region, then you might want to do a global comparable company search. But the preference is for local comparables only. Uh, we have seen this type of requirement even in Korea and some other jurisdictions where authorities are 
very dedicated and focused in terms of the expectation that this is what we would want. In terms of uh, the factors for comparability, I think broadly the factors are common as you would see on the screen, but Egypt has one more factor which states that government policies is also something which we would want to consider in terms of our transfer pricing requirements. So say, suppose if the government says that, okay, this is something which might, which might uh, which might not be permitted from a particular law, then that might also need to be factored in. Let's go to the next slide. I think even in terms of the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, I think uh, what is happening is that generally for the purposes of transfer pricing, we have the concept of capital management and control uh, to define whether we are related or not. I think what they have done here is that in terms of the definition of control, they say that additional consideration is required of financial and trading influence on one person over another, in addition to the standard concept of management capital and control, right? In terms of say equity or governance, et cetera. So they have this additional layer, which also needs to be looked into. Also, it is specified in the guidance that we would not want to take loss making companies for the in the search for potential comparable companies now this is this is a very typical requirement and tax authorities around the world while they would not want uh, uh, loss making comparable companies and even in india we have had similar experience but i think if, if you were to look at transfer pricing principles generally what my experience has been is that in the past we always used to i would say remove consistent loss making companies right now and especially during pandemic times when many businesses have been seriously affected this is something which certainly needs attention that if you exclude loss making companies automatically i think the target is then only companies who are profit making while there is no harm in looking at profit making companies but we need to look at the full spectrum right in terms of the comparability and not only focus on the profit making companies but this is a specific requirement for KSA. Again, in terms of the uh, pricing, I, I think there is this concept of interquartile range, which is commonly used by transfer pricing practitioners across the world. So basically we are we say that if my margin is, it, it falls within the 25th to 75th percentile range, I should be treated at arm's length. Now here, and, and this is something which is followed across many jurisdictions. While India has some specific nuance to this, but generally it's a 25th to 75th percentile. So if you fall within that range, automatically you are at arm's length. Now, coming to KSA, what they say is that you should be at the median, which is the 50th percentile. Now, what we have seen based on our experience is that if you are outside the range of 25th to 50, uh, 75th percentile, in your say transfer pricing audit, then generally the tax authorities would want to push you to the median in terms of the expectation for the adjustment amount, okay? But here what they say is that you have to be at the median and if there is a different position, then we need to have very strong arguments. So this is something which is again, a slight variation as compared to the normal transfer pricing practice. On the comparability uh, factors, I think, an additional point which has been mentioned in addition to what the OECD says is analysis of risk. So I think uh, KSA would even want to look into the analysis of risk aspect in addition to what the OECD has mentioned. Right, so coming on to the economic substance rules. Now, this is something which we have seen uh, being applicable in UAE and Bahrain. And why I have selected this for the purposes of our discussion today is because you know there is there is an overlap between what is expected under these rules vis-a-vis. -vis. Uh, while it's not a complete overlap, but certainly there are touch points which are important for all of us to understand. I think what has been happening is that uh, companies and uh, authorities in the Middle East they are they are just trying to find out that any companies who are operating here whether they have that relevant substance with them in terms of justification for a particular level of say profitability or a particular level of operation. Generally because I think, excuse me, generally what happens is that 
since in UAE we don't have a corporate income tax, so it is always looked at very closely by all the uh, governments and uh, taxing authorities across the world. So what what the authorities have come up here is that we would want to upfront have rules incorporated, which help us understand whether there is that level of substance to justify a particular level of profitability. So what does the rule state that the applicability is to most of the entities, UAE onshore as well as and free zone entities as well. Now, they say that, okay, we would want to first target a relevant activity. So they have defined relevant activity that what are the activities which are covered? So activities like say banking, insurance, fund management, lease finance, headquarters, et cetera, all are something which you will find very common and sizable in, in the region. So they have tried covering those activities first. Then they say that, okay, these are the three tests that you need to take into consideration. The first one being uh, DNM. Now, DNM is directed and managed manage test, right? So what they say is that whether you have the relevant qualified people to take the decision in terms of your operations in the UAE. Then they say that, okay, there is a concept of SIGA, core income generating activities test. Now, again, they say that SIGA must be performed in the UAE. Now, when I say that SIGA must be performed, let's just spend a half a minute on what is SIGA. So SIGA should include the following is what the law states. The law states that SIGA should include transporting, and storing components, parts, these type of activities. So components, parts, materials, or goods ready for sale, managing inventories, and taking orders. So I think what they're trying to target is the actual activities. Now, the third test is where the adequacy test. And this is where they say that, okay, whether you have, we have seen at times companies who are very thinly staffed, right? But if you see the top line, the top line is phenomenal. So at times there is no correlation between the number of people and the revenue generation that the company is doing. Now, might be possible in some very high-tech companies or companies using this very high-tech uh, technologies, but otherwise generally I think there is some broad correlation between the staff as well as the companies. Of course, it is industry specific, but they say that, okay, whether you have adequate staff or employees in the country, Again, whether you have adequate expenditure being done or incurred in the country. So I think they are trying to link it that, okay, you can't be just generating a top line and having a bigger expenditure in UAE. So they are just trying to find that as well. And whether you have actual physical assets in the country to understand and whether to have your business operations performed. I think that is where the distinction is. Now, where do where do, where does the economic substance in the TP rules, whether they converge, they touch, uh, or they don't? I think what we have tried doing is that in the ES rules, I think relevant activity is uh, being targeted, while for the purpose of transfer pricing, it's the related party transaction. So it is RA versus RP. So I think the domain is slightly different. Now, related party transactions can also form part of RA, but at times, activities in RA might not be totally forming part of RP. SIGA and uh, DNM has to be performed in the UAE is what they say. Adequate OPEX, etc. We talked about it, and there is no need. See, if you if you satisfy this substance criteria, then what they say is that then there is no need for performing a benchmarking to understand the. Uh, profitability of an operation, whether it is at arm's length or not. So I think that is something which they, they just rest their case once you establish substance. Why in transfer pricing? Of course, once substance is important, but at the same time, they will also say that whether post all this substance, are you having a particular level of profitability in the jurisdiction? So that is something which is a bit of a difference. We can move to the next slide. Right, so I think some, some takeaways is that if there can be an overlap, as I mentioned, and what happens here is that I can actually use my transfer pricing documentation to 
support the adequacy test because elements in the transfer pricing documentation can very well be used to uh, justify the substance. So that is something which can be used while, of course, it's not replacing the ES test, but it will just supplement and help you out in terms of the justification on the economic substance side. RA, I think Ishan is a relevant activity, which has been defined in the economic substance rules. So the common objective, I think the common objective between both, the common objective between both is that we would want to align. There has to be substance, right? It cannot be, a, if I were to use a naive term, that, that it cannot be a shell company having super normal profits. I think that's the ultimate objective. Again, I think uh, there is some level of uh, flexibility on the transfer pricing side, but I think uh, ES rules are very well defined. Uh, I, I think I think we have covered all this. We can move to the next slide. I think this is the polling question that has come up. And uh, yes, may would want uh, to. I am launching the poll uh, with this polling yeah. questions, and we request members. Uh, this is the first question which Mehul has put in. Let's see what exactly we have understood. I love the way Mehul you have put in the economic substance summarized and perfect on the point the way you have summarized so far, and that is seen from the answers which our members are giving that you are precise on the point and they were able to understand what exactly yes is saying see why uh, it's pretty clear 70 people are saying all of the words so i think your message and your uh, stuff was pretty clear to our members thank you okay five members more still, yeah members are still voting yeah, they are still, I mean, there is still a ticker going on. Someone has stopped it. Okay, uh, this is the scenario. Mil, your take, you want to uh, summarize this poll? Uh, no, I think uh, as you mentioned, and it's all of the above, that's the right answer. And uh, I think uh, what happens is that, uh, and, and thank you members for understanding this. So it's all of the above. So uh, we can actually close the poll and move to the next slide. Sorry for rushing in, but I would actually want to cover many things and I'm just being mindful of the time because I think uh, I think that is, uh, we, I only have around 23 odd minutes, uh, so. Uh, Mehul, uh, uh, you can take a couple of minutes more because uh, our members, you know, we have now 300 plus members. So all want to hear and they want to properly understand. So these are dedicated members. So if you are, uh, shooting time for a couple of minutes. Uh, I don't think we have an issue. Sure, sure. I, mm -hmm. I will try to. I will try to focus while I have many slides to present. Uh, yeah. Thank you for that. What What I will do is that I will try to focus on some of the important takeaways that I would want members to take with them. Okay? Yeah, yeah. And of course, this slide deck will be shared with all of you. So automatically, it will be easier for all of you to have a reference. And of course, you know, as I mentioned, if you have queries, feel free to reach out to me. Uh, I think uh, the uh, Institute will share my email ID as well. So please feel free yeah. to share out, uh, share any queries that you have. And I, if I am able to answer, I will certainly answer those. Now, coming to, I think, uh, the next hot topic, as I mentioned at the start of my session, is that there has been this talk about the G7 countries, right? Uh, which, which, again, I was uh, discussing today morning uh, uh, with uh, Sundarji and he mentioned that this is something which you should cover. So uh, what, what happens is that currently you must have seen that the G7 members met and they said that uh, we would not want a digital services uh, tax. So what has been happening just as a backdrop, what has been happening is that all the tech giants have been, have been if I were to say that they have been not paying the the right amount of tax is the is the notion that many governments across the world have now and accordingly what they have done is that they have started taxing them uh, as per their local understanding so just in case say even in india we introduced the digital uh, transaction tax the, the digital services tax etc and many countries around the world they are trying to tax them what has happened is that over a period of time uh, business has actually moved to a uh, to a much larger uh, domain and context, while the tax laws have still 
been in uh, naive or they have not been updated. So I think this is where it's like a, a cat and mouse game where the law is trying to catch up and businesses have actually gone ahead. So what is happening here is that in terms of the meeting, uh, they said that we would not want a race to the bottom in terms of the tax rates, that more and more countries trying to go to the bottom in terms of their tax existing tax rates to attract more investments. We would want to fix up a minimum tax rate. So the tax rate which they have come up with, while of course this is subject to discussions, deliberations, even you know the applicability, how it will be uh, applicable to countries across the world, etc. all needs deliberation and this is not going to be that easy. But what has happened is that governments, uh, the G7 countries said that we would want to have a minimum tax of 70, uh, 15%. Now, say for countries in the region, right? Uh, Bahrain, I think, say Kuwait, Oman, Saudi Arabia, all are at a rate of 15% or more. But countries on the right side of the slide, be it Bahrain or be it Qatar or be it UAE, here the rate either, say, for Qatar is lower or there is no a corporate income tax for say UAE and Bahrain. Now, what happens to companies who are headquartered in these regions or subsidiaries operating in these regions? There can be two scenarios here. Now, what, what I have done here is that I can just give you an example just to take you through what, what, we, what is the proposition. Now, please bear with me that this is, this is still at a very naive stage, this will be deliberated. And uh, I think OECD is meeting on the 30th of June, the 30th and 30th June and 1st July uh, in Paris to further finalize the political agreement. Because see, I think this is not only tax, this is political agreement, as well as even the technical details, right? So both need to be sorted out. One, countries need to be on board because this is something which has been troubling many countries especially say countries like India and other countries who have not been able to tax the tech giants the way they want. So this is something which will be deliberated in the OECD meeting. Again, I think there is a G20 finance ministers meeting and even the central bank governors meeting, which is somewhere in ninth, uh, somewhere on the 9th and 10th of July. Now, again, in Venice, where again, they will try reaching a initial, I would say agreement on this, on, on pillar two. So uh, I think OECD has come up with pillar one and pillar two. And this is something which uh, is in the domain of, in the ambit of pillar two. So many things to come in here, but at the same time, what if I were to just, since we are discussing this, I've just tried explaining in a, in a very, uh, I would say uh, naive manner. So what happens is that there are profits which are untaxed, okay? They are untaxed in both the jurisdictions if there are two jurisdictions where the companies are operating, suppose. Okay. So what, what they say is that we will have an income inclusion rule, IIR. Okay. So which is if many of you must have encountered this, that there was this concept of controlled foreign company or controlled foreign corporation, CFC. Now, this is similar, okay, whereby the profits of the group companies that are taxed at an effective rate, which is below the minimum tax rate, right? Will be included in the tax base of the ultimate parent company and consequently subject to a top-up tax in that jurisdiction of the ultimate parent entity. So if a country where say the ultimate parent entity doesn't adopt the income inclusion rule, the next intermediate holding company in the chain, in the ownership chain, will calculate and pay the top of taxes in respect of their low tax subsidiaries. So is everybody with me in terms of the concept? They are just trying to tax the untaxed profits. Okay. Again, coming to an example, say, suppose, just take an, another example. Say if a UP, ultimate parent entity, is in a country with low or no tax. Let's take an example of a country which is ultimate parent entity headquartered in UAE. What will happen? That and that uh, and the UAE jurisdiction has not implemented the income inclusion rule. The next intermediary holding company in the ownership chain would calculate 
and pay the top up tax in respect of the low tax subsidiary's profit ideally the profit had to be taxed in uae but because there is no tax in uae they are saying that okay you pick up another company which is in the chain and let that company pay the tax for your low tax subsidiaries profit so suppose in case the low or no tax jurisdiction in which the up is located would lose the tax revenues because i don't have a corporate income tax but and while the primary taxing right is with me but i don't have a corporate income tax so automatically company in the chain will pay the corporate income tax so this is something which jurisdictions like uae bahrain i think there has to be significant amount of deliberation for on this of course subject to the details being out again now let's look at a example conversely right a a, a ultimate parent entity which is located in a country that has implemented iir income inclusion rule but has subsidiaries located in low or no tax countries then what would happen is that you would have to include and pay up tax uh, pay pay the top up tax in respect of its low tax jurist uh, low tax subsidiaries so in other words where these subsidiaries are located would concede that revenue so suppose if it's a indian headquartered company having a subsidiary in uae uae doesn't have tax while the primary taxing right is with uae for the activities that are being undertaken in the uae by that subsidiary i would pay taxes in india for the and it is akin to uae leaving the taxing right right of the profit which is arising in uae so i think this is this is going to be a very interesting situation and only time will tell you know how countries and jurisdictions react to this especially jurisdictions where there is a lower tax rate a lower than 15% or even zero tax rate what what we have been seeing uh, corporations do is that either you know they have been trying to simulate they have been trying to simulate and they have been trying to find out ways and means that suppose if the corporate income tax rate itself is increased right and one important point here is again that they have kept this threshold of 750 million okay 750 million so they are only targeting the biggies they are not targeting small players as yet so i think companies need to think in terms of what happens while this is like a predictive analysis right we don't know what the future holds but at least have some simulations done in terms of how the numbers look like what will be the cash outflow because there is there there is going to be a real cash outflow for many companies right who are in that in, who are who fall within the rules so this is something which companies have started thinking and i think only time will tell how this pans out but i thought i will share with you in terms of what has been happening on the g7 side we can move on to the next slide again in terms of the mli i think countries have signed the mli some of them have not ratified the mli and entry into force of course we you know when 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 this will be effective so most of the countries in the middle east region i think it is applicable from january 2021 so this is the year where the you will see the mli effect as well i am told that kuwait has recently uh, ratified the mli by i don't have the exact details so please bear with me for that but uh, bahrain has still not uh, ratified the mli as well we can move to the next slide ntp controversies and risks so i think while we have touched upon uh, some of the aspects what we have what we have what we have seen is that uh, over a period of time of course tp documentation is always the key and we have been always advocating to our clients to have a tp documentation which is <clears throat> excuse me which is detailed which is a, i i'm just summing this slide up okay in terms of uh, which is detailed which is uh, as close as possible to what you are actually doing on the ground right because at times what we have seen is that things on the ground are very different as compared to what is being told as a story to the tax authorities so that alignment 
is extremely, extremely important. And that is where that robust TP documentation, the way we term it, is something which has to be actually factually aligned in that sense. Again, net losses is something where no tax authorities across the world like that. So uh, there is something. I think uh, Sundarji, you are sending some message. Okay, all right. <clears throat> right. So tax authorities across the world, they actually don't like losses because you know that tax base is something uh, which is dependent on profit. So that is always, and it will always be a criteria which will need evaluation and uh, I would say very close look by the tax authorities. Uh, what we have seen is that even high royalty and technical fee payouts, right, in terms of management charges or even intra-group charges <clears throat> that we have seen, uh, tax authorities look at such type of transactions very, very closely. And I think the underlying rationale uh, is that multinationals take out profit through these mechanisms. And hence, there is a need to understand the transaction, the benefit accruing from the transaction, and whether, okay, I think Josefa is asking me, what is allowed percentage for technical or royalty? Okay, now, Josefa, what happens is that it is very fact specific. So let me just give you an example. Now, <clears throat> There can be royalty payments. Let's stick to royalty for the time being. There can be royalty payments uh, which are, uh, which are say for the usage of brand, or there can be royalty payments which are for the technical know-how. Now, what we have seen is that it varies across industry. So, just to give you a sense of what I am speaking, uh, say suppose if there is a high-tech gaming industry, right? What will happen is that we have seen very high royalty payouts by subsidiaries who are using the technology. The reason for that is that the technology gets outdated very soon or pretty soon. And you know there is this constant need for getting newer things to the audience, right? So the royalty payouts, it's a very short span, can be one year, two years, or even uh, or three years, depending on the technology. But it's a short span and the headquarter or the company who has in, invested in the research and development would want to take out as much money in this short time frame because post that the technology becomes redundant because of the fast changing business. So say for a fast changing business, what we have seen is that the royalty payouts are very high. Now there can be some businesses which are which are stable businesses. There the royalty payouts are uh, are over a period of time standardized and you know Amounts can be 2%, 5%, depends, but it is very, very industry specific. So I will not be able to generalize a percentage. Hope that answers. Uh, I think Mehul, you can continue with your presentation and then uh, after your presentation, we'll have a Q&A. Sure, sure. Yeah. So, so I, think, I think in terms of, uh, the controversies that we have seen in India, as I mentioned earlier, that uh, the clue that we are taking here is that the region also will face similar type of issues. While every tax authority has their learning curve, right, in terms of uh, what they will ask at the start when they are auditing, now that we are seeing much more action in the Middle East, and what gradually where they go to. So I think selection of method, etc., or these are issues which are very standardized and i'm not saying that these issues will not come up this issue certainly will come up but more and more we are trying to uh, we are seeing that the tax authorities are focusing on areas like financial transactions they are also focusing on say marketing intangibles etc and that is the reason what i have done is that i've actually taken up slides on intangibles that is the key because i think the future of litigation will be heavily surrounded around intangible. So I've tried touching on those aspects in my ensuing slides. But what we have seen is that tax authorities have also been moving up the value chain and pretty quickly, they learn faster than us. So is that is what my experience has been. So we will see newer areas coming in, in terms of the overall process. I think we can move to the next slide. Here, see, here is an example that I have uh, put across just uh, for everybody to look into. Uh, 
I think I'll just sum it up because uh, of the time constraint. What will happen here is that, um, uh, what will happen here is that uh, in terms of say, uh, ABC company has been uh, providing headquarters. See, I think UAE as a region has headquarter companies and there will be charges which are which will flow from UAE to various countries, including the other countries in the in the GCC. Now, that charges can be for or for many count, right? Because say I have a centralized team for treasury, for forex, for strategy, for marketing. I, I may have a centralized team for doing many things at the headquarter level. Now, all these benefit even the subsidiaries. So the charges have to be pushed down to the subsidiaries as well. Now, once companies start pushing these charges to the subsidiaries, I think questions will come mainly from the subsidiary side because they are making a payout, okay? What, what they will say is that whether there was, I think there are three, uh, it's, it's like a tripod on which questions are based. The first one is whether there was a need for this service. Second one is whether the services were actually received. And the third one is benefits which have accrued to that subsidiary who has been making a payout. So I think this is a very critical issue. Uh, I, Sundarji, I, I will not be able to address all the questions. I'm just trying to move through my slides, but no, I'll no, be happy no to... problem. No problem. Because remember, whenever they have opportunity, they will type the question. Then later on, we will select some and ask you. No problem. Yes, you don't yes. need to pay attention to the question. Right, right. Yeah, okay. yeah. No so, problem. So I think I think these are these are NRB, the need, receipt, and benefit. I think that is something which is critical in terms of uh, the justification for a particular charge. And I, one case law which I have picked up, the French case law, is typically for this one, where companies where they were not able to justify that whether the services were actually rendered and what was the benefit. So I think the court decided against the taxpayer because the justification was not present. So we will have to be very careful in terms of what you build as a justification on this count. You will see more and more of such type of charges being levied by the headquarter companies across the region and across jurisdictions. Yeah, we can move to the next slide. Again, I think I had picked up maybe procurement structures. This is something which is uh, self-explanatory in terms of uh, what are the different types of procurement structures that we have seen generally and also important for the uh, Middle East region. If you go to the next slide, you will see that I have actually outlined what are the, what are the, what is the fact pattern of such models and what is the remuneration that is generally being ex uh, accepted or expected by the tax authorities. Yes, we can move. To, you, can, you can go through this at peace. Again, this is something, you know, where we have been seeing this value chain analysis as a concept where we are trying to say that, okay, one is the functional analysis that we do, but over and above the functional analysis, the other way of, or maybe an aligned or a allied way of looking at it is that where the value is generated, right? In terms of, say, as a group, if I were to look at the group as a whole, there are pockets in the group where value is generated, where there is this competitive advantage, right? In terms of, if I have, say, I'm just giving you a very naive example, but if I have a profitability of, say, 10%, and my competitor has a profitability of 5%, okay? There is, there is some distinct advantage that I enjoy for the differential of 5%. Now, we just try finding that out here so that we are able to understand, we are able to understand where, where the value is generated. For this, what I have done is that as an appendix, I have actually put in an example for, uh, for everybody to understand and relate to because, you know, once you go through the example, I have tried, while it's a very gray area, but at the same time, we have tried putting in something so that it is easier for members to ponder over and think through. Again, in terms of uh, intangibles, as I mentioned that intangibles is something which is, which is critical in the transfer pricing world. And I see maximum amount of litigation happening in this area. So, because the general, I, uh, the general underlying principle here is that intangibles attract profit. Now, 
there are functions, risks, and funding aspects of an intangible. And OECD has come up with detailed guidelines. So for uh, people who are interested, they can certainly go through the guidelines while this is evolving. But this is an area where I believe there will be huge amount of uh, litigation in future. So we need to be very sure and need to have a solid documentation when it comes to intangibles. So gone are the days where erstwhile what used to happen is that, and I have chosen an example as well, erstwhile what used to happen, let's take an example of say a US company, and this is a live case that I have worked on, uh, a US company and an Indian subsidiary. Now Indian subsidiary is into research and development and the US company funds the research, right? So yeah, thank you Siddharth for going to that example. Uh, so the US company, uh, here it's a UAE company. So the UAE company is funding for that research. Now, India does everything. If I were to just sum it up in terms of taking the decisions, in terms of what is the research that I should be doing, India has the qualified staff, etc. Now, India then cannot be just given a cost plus return for its activity that, okay, I will give you a cost plus a 15% markup. And that's about it. Indian authorities will certainly challenge the position and say that, okay, India is doing much more. And I would want to understand what India is doing vis-a-vis -vis what UAE is doing. And if it is proved that, okay, UAE practically just funds the research, then UAE should just be getting that funding return. UAE doesn't have any control over the risk. It is India which does everything. So the maximum return should flow to India as compared to the cost plus approach, which generally we have seen. Yes, moving to the next slide. I think there is this polling question. Question is on, is there? I can see answers have started coming in. So it's a mixed bag management charges somewhere around 47% members are agreeing royalty is somewhere at 33%. Right. So I think this is in line with expectation. Uh, what we have seen is that what we have seen is that management charges and royalty form the bulk of litigation and uh, procurement structures also have been challenged. Now, I think it is very important that say in terms of procurement structures, we have to, uh, while this is the underlying concept for any activity that we analyze for transfer pricing, but procurement structures, there has to be a well-defined business objective for us to set up a procurement company. And so I was working with a client. Now the client was into this soft tubes, which are used for two paste, et cetera, right? They require the plastic granules. So they were wanting to set up a company in the Middle East because that was the location where plastic granules, et cetera, are procured. So see here, there is this business objective in terms of why I would want a structure here in the Middle East because I'm more closer to the relevant suppliers. I, I'm able to negotiate better, et cetera. So there has to be that business objective. And then I think things which will be much more easier for us to justify. Right, we can move to the next slide. Sundarji, how much time do I have? I would not want to encroach on Nitesh's territory. Uh, Hari sir? Yeah, I think uh, maybe uh, if you can conclude in another two, three minutes, that will be great because then we will have QA uh, maybe for five minutes. So, okay, if you can so conclude, I think so that if you can just. Yeah. Uh, sure, sure. So, so that if you can scroll down. I'm just not able to change the slide. Uh... So that unshare and share again if you're not able to change the slide. Yes. Can you just unshare and share again if you're not able to do that? Okay. So meanwhile, while uh, Siddharth is... Uh changing the slides, let me just uh, try covering something, you know, in the interest of uh, time. So see what, what happens is that even in terms of um, 
the case laws, uh, as I mentioned that, okay, I have covered two case laws. One was on management charges and the other one was uh, for the Coca-Cola company. Now, if you go through this, you will be able to understand what we are trying to put across. One point of a caution that we would want to uh, put across here is that in case of Coca-Cola company, there was already an agreed position with IRS before on the on the parameters which are being put across in the slide deck, right? But at the same time, what the IRS said that things have changed. You can't be relying on what you were relying, say, five, 10 years ago at this point of time, okay? And we actually don't agree to your stated position. So this is something where a position which was agreed by the tax authorities or stripe has been challenged and has been also challenged in favor of the tax authorities by the court as well. So the court also has cited by the tax authorities uh, because they say that, okay, based on the new web section plans, et cetera, the way the world has transformed, no longer you can be parking profits in the so-called low tax jurisdictions where there is a lack of intangible. We can move to the next slide. I think global transfer pricing updates. Uh, the United Nations has come up with a practice manual again uh, in 2021 uh, for developing countries. It's a good read, something which is interesting and UN always has a very clear point of view. Uh, India, I think they have revised the threshold. That is fine. I think in United Kingdom, see now more and more countries are moving towards this three-tiered approach where erstwhile United uh, Kingdom didn't have or didn't accept the OECD recommendation of a three-tiered approach. But now what they are saying is that we would want to start on this as well. So erstwhile it was only CBCR, but now I think they are also looking into the local file and master file, et cetera. It is self-explanatory. So I am just rushing through this. Uh, Maldives, Zambia, everybody is uh, acting on the TP side. Uh, we have covered the global minimum tax rate of G7, uh, the G7 development uh, in my earlier discussion. So that is something pillar one, pillar two is something which we have covered. Now, the use of, I think, uh, use of technology, and we have a couple of polling questions here as well. Polling question three and four, if we can quickly go through that, and uh, I'll be happy to then take the participants to what my thoughts are. Um, okay, now the responses start coming in. How do right. you manage transfer pricing compliance for your global business? Interesting. Members, you have to be a little fast. We will just end uh, in, in another seven seconds this poll. Oh, numbers are this 70% is going on third was centralized management of group transfer pricing. Maybe I'm closing this poll. Sure, sure. So I think I think the message is conveyed, and this is the message that I also wanted to convey is that more and more post the base erosion and profit shifting plans by the OECD, we have seen the centralized management approach because companies and com the headquarter would want to give a standard and same story, right? And what we have seen is that more and more people are centralizing their transfer pricing documentation. So erstwhile there has been that this decentralized approach where we say that, okay, there has been uh, a transfer pricing documentation is prepared by various consultants across the jurisdiction, depending on the consultant that, that I like as a, as a tax director, right? But now more and more, we are seeing that level of centralization because tax authorities across the world have been sharing data rapidly and rampantly in terms of the size and scale of data. So it is very important for us to understand that we have to tell a proper story and a story which is not contradictory, right? So we have actually been helping many clients on their global documentation from here in India. So that is something which where we have a huge team which prepares the reports and there is that level of standardization. So it's the same story that I tell rather than a differing version. Polling question, uh, we can go to the next polling question as well. But I guess I'm struggling with the changing of slides. Yes, Jay, I'm not able to again uh, change the slide. Okay. I think, uh, Mehul, we can uh, take up a question and answer if you want. Uh, all right. So I think, I think more and more what we are seeing is that uh, transfer pricing, again, in terms of the usage of technology has not been behind, be it in terms of uh, the 
dempy function analysis or be it in terms of you know the documentation tool etc there is technology which has been helping uh, in standardizing things in putting things across jurisdictions in a in a expected manner so happy to maybe you know take a session on that as well whenever there is time uh, yeah in terms of question and answers yeah thank thank you very much uh, mr mahul uh, sir for your excellent presentation i think uh, uh, audience have liked your presentation so once you share with us i'll send it to all the members so they can go through in detail and if they have any other question maybe they can reach to you uh, you have touched upon i mean apart from transfer, transfer pricing you have touched upon country by country reporting economic substance reporting and multilateral convention to implement tax treaties thank you very much and you also spoke about the corporate income tax possibility in uae so let's see i mean consultants will be we all will be happy rather <laughs> so that uh, everybody is getting some sort of consultancy uh, you know income as well and uh, now i request to our excom can member I, ca can Manoran. i just have a sorry but uh, harikishan ji yeah. can i just have a closing remark i would uh, i would just want to touch upon the point that mr bukhati had mentioned right that yeah, transparency please, please. i think transparency is the key so right, sir. Uh, he he mentioned that at the start of his uh, speech and i completely uh, align with what he mentioned yeah over to you okay yeah yeah thank you very much sir and uh, i think now i request our excom member uh, ca manoran parali pelarichal to manage and moderate q and a with uh, ca mahul uh, over to you manu thank you sir thank you hari sir if uh, the, my name full name pronunciation is very difficult for you then you see any time you can call me as manu <laughs> yeah thank you uh, uh, mahul ji yeah it was um, uh, very interesting session especially i am also practicing in this uh, region so for me it is very interesting session so most of the questions what we have seen uh, can you can uh, that sharing of the screen can be stopped makes sense so that can you pull this off sure perfect thank you so very interesting and we have seen a lot of questions so we we'll let, let us take up maximum questions to answer within the available time just uh, to begin with i have a, a question so i am getting an opportunity to clarify from you so this uh, bep sections uh, uh, since uae is uh, uh, an inclusive member of uh, oecd and minimum four actions has to be uh, complied with so one of that is the uh, bep section 5 uh, that is the uh, countering harmful tax practices so that is uh, why uae has implemented uh, economic substance regulation so when uh, uh, uae is not implementing uh, transfer pricing to what extent the uae is in line with the compliance of uh, bep section 5 whether we can we expect implementation of uh, transfer pricing as well in uae in future i i believe that this is just a matter of time uh, uh cm manoharan that there will be implementation right and even even in terms of tax rates as well see i cannot be left out of the crowd if i would want to be that finance capital the so called finance capital right of the region i will have to be in line in terms of the regulations while i may want to keep it sweet for the Just corporations but at the same time i i cannot be a uh, not aligned is what my sense is it's just a matter of time yeah so in that case even uae is having uh, it's, it's a tax free country or uh, income tax is there only for very uh, one or two sectors very limited that is for the uh, foreign banks and also but in large uh, there is no income tax uh, we can say in uae uh, so harsh doshi also has asked a question relevant question relation to that one uae is not part of g7 or g20 but part of oecd of course and when is the ue when ue is expected to implement a corporate tax post to expo or uh, whether uh, we uh, ue is expected to implement a tax that's his question he is expecting your view with the related to that one while while i'll, I'll just uh, correlate with this one earlier ue was blacklisted because of non compliance of oecd guidelines then it is removed from blacklist again aml compliance was there and then some uh, uh, some uh, some uh, uh, press release and all we have seen so uh, that's why we implemented uh, aml uh, as well uh, recently so in future to be in uh, in, in the in the uh, limelight 
in the, in the worldwide along with the well uh, developed countries. So UAE has to implement this 15 percentage tax rate as well, right? See, my sense is that it is not as simple as it looks. There will be nuances, etc. But the way the world is progressing on tax, you would not want to be a different sheep, right? In the herd, you would want to be aligned because you know what happens is that as a jurisdiction, there are repercussions if I'm in the blacklist or even in the grey list, right? So I think more and more countries are realizing that that if I want to attract investments. i would want to be in the good books right now you know we'll have to just balance it out in terms of how do i have the tax uh, or the no tax regime vis-a-vis the tax regime and how do i balance it out i think and what we are currently looking at uh, uh, manoharan is that we are looking at very large players for the time being right yeah, i think right. it will be it will be important to understand once it start per, starts percolating down to smaller players as well i think that is that is a key point that's right but uh, in the case of uh, cbcr only we are targeting the large uh, uh, corporates multinational companies but in case of uh, esr economic substance regulation even any any transaction any limited transactions also will be applicable any uh, single transaction also will fall into this regulation right right so i think see this is this is the i would say output because we were in blacklist in terms of jurisdiction right that we would want to be that okay it's not companies are setting up shops here because there is zero tax rate or mm. showing high level of profitability in the region but there is that substance also which is married to it i think that is where that is where the change thought process came into play and i think over a period of time my sense is that why we need to see how oecd comes up with it right and even that political consensus is very important so this is not something which is so easy correct correct yeah so uh, if anybody wants to ask question there are some questions already in the chat box but i prefer if uh, any of the members would like to ask a, qu- a question please raise your hand so that we can also will uh, ask ashish like- I-, i think ashish is a good old friend and thank you for putting in the comment ashish glad to be connected again yeah sweta has uh, raised her hand so sweta you can unmute yourself and then raise question and if you can come uh, switch on your camera as well uh yeah hi uh i just wanted to ask a question uh i have a company in ue and a sister concern in another country which is an african country and a few of the products that i'm dealing in uh that company may or may not be one of the consumers to it so uh, according to the transfer pricing rules uh, if uh, you know if i sell it to another company in uae and that company sells it to my african company would transfer pricing be applied to me and to that company both can i just suggest something i am happy to discuss this with you offline if it is okay with you because you know i okay. i am actually eating into other speakers time so please bear yeah, with yeah, no me problem, no problem no problem that would you you have my email id mehul shah at deloitte please feel free to okay uh, i'll do it. So, you know okay. put me a email and i'm happy to connect okay yeah thank you thank you sada so and now uh, ashish is there ashish uh, mr ashish yeah, can you there, there is there is a difficult question coming from a friend hi ashish how are you yeah ashish you are on mute can you unmute yourself yes thanks yeah. thanks a lot a professional question from mehul uh, not a difficult one rather a very practical question uh, mehul uh, given that you are from deloitte india and we already have a deloitte uae practice and uh, if somebody is from the deloitte uae or from deloitte ksa i just want a very uh, simple question so that mehul uh, we are also aligned how does the deloitte practice take it like will it be uh, conflicting or will the ua deloitte practice uh, cooperate with you because see the the purpose of transfer pricing documentation is for penalty protection or is for uh, is for uh, tax representation see going forward 3 years down the line or 2 years down the line when the matter comes or gets picked up and i'm it's a very practical point whether that time the deloitte ksa will uh, you know come together and and work on it or then 
uh, you know it will be contradictory to the deloitte uh, principle or you will okay. have a sign off from deloitte ksa because given that india as you said uh, india is a hub of a very good uh, you know you get very good quotes i hope this is a, a not a tough question but a very practical question from yeah, it is. all uh, big mne groups who are based in dubai it is it is and and see generally we work in tandem okay with our local offices as well so you know that is something which is a given and what happens ashish as you rightly pointed out that we actually have a sign off depending on the jurisdiction and the complexity right so it is not because see as as a tax payer and tomorrow of course you know once you have a sign off it will be easy for a deloitte local firm to even represent you in terms of your audit proceedings so that should not be an issue no but the sign off see the problem is if you have they take a deliberate sign off from the deloitte ksa then the economics doesn't match mehul to be very honest to you as part of a mne group if deloitte india does a documentation as per oecd because you will not do a documentation as per ksa right you will do a right. documentation as per oecd and right. then if we go for deloitte uh, ksa to sign off that particular documentation then it is worth engaging a deloitte ksa directly so then where we have say 100 reports for the whole uh, group as you rightly said egypt ua not ua sorry egypt uh, ksa now qatar coming into picture you have other regions you know and you have big operations <laughs> then how do you marry deloitte india and deloitte uh... no so ashish let's do this let's connect offline okay because okay. what will happen is that i have already encroached 21 minutes of the next speaker's yeah. time i am just okay. looking at okay. my watch really so sorry please bear with me so i uh, happy to connect offline ashish with you right no 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 thank no you. problem yeah. thank you so, thank you thank so you. much uh, mahil ji so we will uh, uh, stop the q and a session uh, here and then uh, other questions will be sharing with you then we can take it forward sure. happy to do that and thank you everyone for a very patient hearing Uh, friends, I request a big round of applause to C. A. Mahul Sir, and uh, thank you very much to our EXO member Manoharan as well for moderating the Q and A with uh, C. A. Mahul. Uh, now we would like to present a certificate of appreciation, Sir, on behalf of the I. C. I. Dubai chapter. So just bear with us. This is tax free yes, certificate, uh, without tax. <laughs> thank you for this thank you the icai dubai team for this and really it was good interacting with all of you yeah thank you thank you very much mehul uh, uh john you can remove the certificate and uh, now it's again a small break actually for the sponsors and uh, i would request uh, john to play the video for our platinum sponsors Greetings from UHY in UAE. I'm James Matthew. Some of you may know me as your past chairman in 2012-13. Some of you also may know me as someone who has been associated with a top 10 accountancy firm here in the UAE for the last 24 plus years. I said I transitioned in the year 2019 December along with five of my partners and 75 staff to set up UHY James Chartered Accountants in UAE. UHY International is the 16th largest accounting firm globally, and it has presence in 100 plus countries across 330 offices. Between six of our partners, we bring about 150 plus years of practice and domain expertise. We wish the team ICAI Dubai chapter all the very best for their annual 38th annual conference. and once again my best wishes to all my friends from ca fraternity for a very happy and prosperous 2021 thank you for over 6 generations we have been serving our customers what matters to them most year after year generation after generation we've been able to present premium quality with best prices for our valuable customers welcome to ifco 
From our headquarters in Dubai, we oversee 80 world-class operations across 40 countries on five continents. Adding flavor to your life is what we pride on, and we do it best through our wide range of product segments. Whether it's efficient movement by sea, extensive transportation by road, or expertise in procurement, handling, and storage, we stay on top of our game to get our quality products from farms to your table as swiftly and smoothly as possible. Meanwhile, IFCO's professional products and services segment was specifically created to craft specialized ingredients for specific channels. To ensure that you have the right product for your business, our quality team ensures that each of our consignments is subjected to a thorough and rigorous quality control regime at every step of the process. Our state-of-the-art facilities help us to achieve this because innovation and R&D lie at the heart of IFCO. And that's why for over 45 years, we've anticipated needs and delivered above expectations to earn the confidence of our customers. We are HLB Hamt, the doyens in the world of finance. For smooth functioning of the business, it's critical to have the financial health check at regular intervals. We have financial experts who dedicate personalized attention and provide tailor-made solutions to solve their financial complexities. Our association with HLB International ensures that we constantly enhance the benchmark of quality with over 2,000 clients, 1,500 plus company incorporations, 200 plus team members, more than 15 years of service. International accreditations and offices across the region make us the trust. Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, John. Uh, now our next speaker, C. A. Nitesh Mehta, is going to address us on m and structuring considerations in India, inbound and outbound investments. And to introduce him, I would like to invite our XCOM member, C. A. Jayaprakash Agarwal. Over to you, Jay. Thank you, Rizal. Thanks a lot. Two hour session with Mehul. I loved one word which he said, transparency. Transparency is important not only for transfer pricing, but also for your relationships official, personal, documentation everywhere. Transparency is something which I take away from first session. Now, moving on to the second session, which is on merger and acquisitions. And for that session, we have CA Nitesh Mehta with us. CA Nitesh Mehta is a partner with BDO for handling M&A tax and regulatory practice. He operates out of Mumbai office and has 20 plus years of experience in consulting. Prior to joining BDO, he was working with large consulting firms and his specialization is corporate restructuring, M&A structuring and implementation, stressed asset structuring, PE transaction. He has advised and executed assignments on corporate mergers, demergers, internal capital reorganizations, balance sheet right sizing, minority buyout, setting up tax efficient structures for both domestic and cross-border entities. His experience span across various sectors and includes infrastructure, healthcare, pharma, IT, financial services, media, entertainment, real estate, manufacturing, and many more. With these words, I will invite C. A. Nitesh Mehta for the session. C. A. Nitesh Mehta, sir, podium is yours. Thanks, Jay. Uh, and uh, I would request uh, Kirti, my team member, to present the slide deck. Kirti, are you there? Perfect. Yeah. Okay, so first of all, uh, you know, it was a very interesting session by Mehul and that has made my task much more tougher. Uh, because after going through such a educative and informative session, uh, I just hope that I will be able, I will be also able to do justice to my presentation. So first of all, respected chairman and committee members at Dubai chapter of ICAI and good evening to the CA fraternity in Dubai. Uh, and a thank, very, very big thank you for the opportunity provided to me to take up this session on mergers and acquisition. 
Topic for this session is MNA structuring consideration for India inbound and outbound MNA transaction. And particularly, I've seen that uh, UAE generally, you know, there are headquarters based out of uh, UAE and especially in Dubai, from where India centric MNA activities or the groups are based in. While I, what I've done in my presentation, I've mentioned the different modes in which MNA activities take place key tax and regulatory considerations surrounding those modes. And also I've tried to capture some of the case studies, case studies which dealing with such structures. So let's start. Uh, as you know, MNA is a global trend. Uh, for India, it all started in early 90s, almost three decades back, when Indian economy was opened up for foreign investment. Since then, gradually, not only foreign investments have been allowed in Indian entities, but the Indians are also allowed to go global and make investments and do acquisitions. If we really look at at this stage, foreign investment in India is allowed in almost all sector bearing a few where either a cap is prescribed up to which a foreign investment is allowed or there are certain conditions are prescribed. And there are a few sectors which are completely prohibited like for example, gambling. Now, for example, now let's take about a sector where there are certain conditions which are prescribed say for example, a retail activity. Foreign investment in retail trade or retail activity is allowed, but it is subject to various conditions. Now, despite pandemic year, Indian m and market has, is, you know, has been buzzing with a lot of deals. Some of the market transactions which took place over last year also includes likes of the big tech like Facebook. Uh, they are investing into the Geo platform, which is a Reliance Group based entity. At the same time, Indian corporates have made acquisitions abroad as well as in India. Today, the sentiments on MA activities continues to be very optimistic in India, be it a corporate MA transaction or a private equity deals. Particularly, if you look at the trend in the IT, ITA sector and the financial service sector, there is a lot of activities and a lot of transactions which have taken place, even though it was a pandemic year. And it is largely expected that India will see a very sharp V shaped recovery once the pandemic is over and such recovery would only enhance the deal flow. So why people do m &A, correct? I mean, what is the need for people to do undertake the m &A transaction? Some of the reasons why people do m &A activities could be, for example, the inorganic growth or the economies of scale. In inorganic growth is, as you know, it is the faster way to grow, acquire the target and just grow, correct? While one can grow organically also, but it will certainly take a longer time as compared to an inorganic growth by way of an acquisition. Another reason could be the need for the funds to grow. So for example, if somebody is looking at growing, then it will uh, that particular entity will need funds. And that funds can be raised either on the private basis or it could be through a public market IPO or initial public offering. In the world of uncertainty, de-risking is also an important factor behind MA activities. We have seen that companies are actually looking at spreading and going to the different geographies just to minimize the risk. For example, recent pandemic we have seen, correct? The countries were highly dependent on China for certain activities. And the pandemic has actually sent a message that you need to de-risk yourself by spreading across the geographies. Another reason could be there could be multiple entities in one business. Now, what happens when there are multiple businesses in one entity, they actually do not reflect the current value of the, uh, of the company or the organization. Now, in such a case, in order to unlock the hidden value, people undertake m and activities, they either uh, bifurcate or I mean, either undertake the m and activities in such a manner that the core and non-core activities are bifurcated. Recently, you would have also heard about, uh, if you're tracking the Indian market on the MNS side, you would have heard about the insolvency code being introduced in India. It has been introduced since last couple of years. Uh, and there is a lot of push on the recovery of the bad loans from the banks, uh, 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 which are granted by the banks from the promoters and the companies. Now, this has led to actually promoters start thinking and they are looking at avenues to undertake some MN activities whereby they can raise money and just make sure that the business actually remains with them and does not get dragged into the insolvency process. Last and not the least in India, there are a lot of family owned businesses and probably this is true across the world. As family grows, the businesses grow and there could be a need to restructure the businesses which itself may require some m activity just to make sure that the aspiration of the family members are being taken care. Now, before we get into the modes in which m and take, 
takes place as mr bukhatir earlier mentioned in his uh, uh, in his uh, speech that what could be the process there is a need to follow a particular process in mna activities so let me just touch upon that briefly first stage would be to undertake a commercial negotiation where parties to the transaction they sit across the table and commercially negotiate the key parameters of the deal the next would be to enter into something called as a term sheet or a non binding term sheet where parties actually document the broader commercial understanding and thereafter the stage of due diligence starts which there are different type of due diligences for example finance due diligence a tax due diligence legal due diligence secretarial due diligence and we have also seen that some of the private equity players they are also now insisting on something called as esg due diligence that is environmental social and governance due diligence and at times the uh, players also would like to undertake something called as a commercial due diligence so these are the different type of due diligence which take place as a part of the mna process now once the dd is done due diligence is completed the stage of preparing the transaction documentation start and that's where the negotiation comes into picture the typical negotiation could involve negotiation for example on the indemnities uh, where the parties have to decide how the indemnities will play out in in an event where something so some promises of the representations which are done in the transaction document does not hold good now when the transaction documents are finalized there is something called as an execution date and there is something called as an closing date now between the execution date and the closing date there could be certain condition precedences which have to be completed so once the condition precedent typically the word used is cps when the cps to the transactions are completed then the closing takes place and at that point in time the actual exchange of assets or the shares or uh, and the cash takes place between the parties and at times uh, there could be certain condition subsequent to the transaction which also have to be sub completed after the transaction is over and that typically both the buyers and the sellers will have certain monitoring people who will monitor this completion of the condition subsequent now let's talk about what are the modes in which the mna transaction could be carried out there could be different modes uh, acquisition is a most common mode in mna activities so when it comes to acquisition one would have a choice to either acquire the company itself that is a share acquisition or acquire a business and when i talk about acquisition of a business there could be again two options which would be available either i acquire a business uh, as a lock stock and uh, uh, for a lump sum consideration which is typically called as a business acquisition or a slum sale acquisition or there could be acquisition of identified assets where i pick and choose the assets which i want to acquire now in terms of indian context if i want to talk about some acquisitions also took take place by undertaking something called as a merger demerger which is a court approved process uh, especially when we talk about a domestic transaction involving two domestic indian parties merger and demerger could be one of the options which people explore and there are reasons behind it because for example merger demerger typically would be tax neutral there are tax losses which can get migrated even in a merger demerger scenario of, of course subject to certain uh, satisfaction of certain conditions so merger demerger could be one of the options now as i said domestic certainly merger demerger could be an option in case of cross border merger when it comes to inbound merger into an indian entity so for example a foreign entity merging into indian entity that has been happening and that is your for example we have seen i have seen lot of uh, mauritian companies or companies from the eu they get folded into the indian company but the outbound merger that is an indian entity getting folded into an overseas entity is very very rare side because of the foreign exchange regulations in india and there are various conditions at the same time it may not be a tax neutral transaction so that's the reason outbound merger is not very popular in india but inbound merger is certainly now there could be a certain kind of capital restructuring uh, which may be may be undertaken for example buyback uh, now buyback typically could be undertaken one to give an exit to a particular set of shareholders or it could be to repatriate cash which are lying in the indian entity now of course i have taken a slide subsequently which deals with how the buyback could be tax efficient when the profit repatriation takes place using a buyback mode now let's start with inbound mna activities and how the indian inbound mna scenario works as i said uh, before we get into uh, the different modes uh, there could be various tax and regulatory implication which one would need to be mindful especially when we talk about an indian inbound scenario 
The reason being in India, there are various laws which are there and each law will have certain implications when we talk about M&A transaction. The first and foremost, I would say the foreign exchange law, which is called as a FEMA and any cross-border transaction would need to take into consideration the FEMA implications. The other would be the, of course, the income tax and the indirect tax implication. Like you have VAT in the UAE, we have something called as a GST, that is goods and services tax in India. And that may also have implications on the transaction. The another important aspect in Indian context is a stamp duty implication. Now, stamp duty is a state specific levy. It may differ from state to state and therefore it becomes a very important transaction cost to be considered while framing and finalizing a transaction structure. Now, from a compliance perspective, uh, when we talk about dealing with a listed entity for, or dealing with an unlisted entity, there could be aspects like security law, which one has to look at, or there could be aspects like company law or the LLP, which is a Limited Liability Partnership Act, one of will have to look at. Now, in India, a few years back, we have adopted uh, a new accounting standard, which is called as INDAS, Indian Accounting Standard which is in line with the IFRS and it is applicable to certain set of entities, especially all the listed entities and there are certain bigger entities which gets covered by this. And that's why this has become very important to look at any transaction. Earlier it was not so important, but now because of INDAS and IFRS akin to an accounting system, it has become very important, especially where the transaction involves a listed entity. We in India, we also have a competition law uh, where unless the entity or the group falls into the exemption category, one has to actually take prior approval of the competition regulator before the transaction is concluded. And last but not the least, there could be sector specific regulations. So for example, if somebody is looking at doing transaction in insurance space, then the insurance regulators approval will be required. So the point that I'm trying to make is one actually has to take a, take a holistic approach while deciding a particular transaction structure because if one looks at only one of the aspects, then there could be other aspects which may actually defeat the transaction structure. Now, moving on, uh, what could be the different transaction structures, correct? Uh, so as I said, the popular modes could be a share acquisition uh, or a business purchase or an asset purchase transaction. So what I've tried to do, uh, the, I've tried to try is try doing in this particular slide is given a broad comparison of how these different modes of acquisition could pair vis-a-vis -vis certain key parameters, which one actually has to consider while framing the transaction structure. So let's first start with the valuation. Uh, in India, when, a, as I said, we have foreign exchange regulation. So when a foreigner, foreigner looks at acquiring shares or any instrument, then under FEMA, the same, ca same cannot be at a price which is less than the fair market valuation. So let's take an example. If the fair value of shares of an Indian company is say 100, then the non-resident cannot make an acquisition at less than 100. It has to be at 100 or more than that. Further, there is also a tax valuation requirement that the trans, uh, it says that if the transaction takes place at a price which is less than the prescribed tax valuation norms, then the difference gets taxed in the hands of both seller and buyer. So let's say in my earlier example, where let's assume that the fair value was 100. Parties have also commercially agreed to do the transaction at 100. So it meets the FEMA valuation norm. But as per tax valuation norm, the valuation actually comes to 110. Now, in that scenario, while the government does not say that the transaction has to happen at 110, the transaction can still go forward and can be done at 100. But the difference between 100 and 110, that is the trans pri transaction price and the tax valuation price, the difference of 10, 10 will get taxed both in the hands of the buyer and the seller, and the buyer and the seller will have to pay tax on that. So that is why both FEMA valuation norm as well as the tax valuation norm for a share transaction would be very important. Similarly, when we look at a business acquisition, recently in the last budget that is that has come on the 1st of February, the government has actually come out with a tax valuation norm even in a business transaction scenario or a business sales scenario. Broadly, it says that you look at the book value of the business that is getting transferred, of course, with certain adjustments. But when we look at an asset purchase transaction from a valuation standpoint, unless the asset which is transferred, say for example, is an immovable property, then there are no prescribed valuation norms. So for example, if there is an IP getting transferred, then there is no specified valuation norm which is there under the tax code. Thus in an asset purchase transaction, there could be actually some flexibility could be available if tax valuation norm is actually becoming a concern in a uh, uh, tra transaction 
uh, when a, and when a choice has to be made between an asset purchase or a business purchase or an asset uh, or a share purchase now apart from the valuation the other important aspect and that is where typically the discussion takes place between the seller and the purchaser is what would be the tax outgo for the seller and what would be the benefit for the buyer in future by undertaking the transaction in a particular mode now among the option which are mentioned when the money is expected to be in the hands of the promoters or the shareholders or the selling uh, shareholders generally share sale is more tax efficient because the money comes directly in the hands of the selling shareholders but if the transaction is undertaken in the form of a say a slum sale or an asset sale the money will first go to the selling entity and thereafter the further upstreaming of that has to take place in the hands of the shareholder from the company to the shareholder there could be further tax leakages which may be there and therefore if the money is required in the hands of these shareholders or the owners probably share sale could be a better option as compared to undertaking a slum sale or an asset sale transaction but let's look at from the buyer side from the buyer side the preference could be a slum sale or an asset acquisition rather than undertaking a share purchase transaction now the reason for that is from a tax perspective when the buyer purchases business or assets under a slum sale or an assets purchase scenario it can actually carry pay, uh, ca claim depreciation on the acquisition price now no such benefit would be available when we talk about a share acquisition because in case of share acquisition the balance sheet of the target remains as is it is just the shares which are getting exchanged so the historical tax return down values in the box book, books of the target will continue and the tax depreciation will continue on that but in case of slum sale or an asset purchase the acquirer actually can record the purchase price for the respective assets and claim tax depreciation on such acquisition price that has been paid by paid by the purchaser now in recent budget tax law has been amended to provide that no tax depreciation would be allowed on goodwill even though the goodwill will be an acquired goodwill before that the goodwill was tax depreciable now what has happened because of that because of this particular change in co in case of slum sale typically a purchase price allocation exercise is carried out by the buyer to record the assets in its books of account now in doing so invariably what happens that the balance consideration gets attributable to the goodwill now earlier the goodwill was tax depreciable so everything was fine people used to prefer the slum sale because there are other advantages but because of this recent change now the goodwill is not tax depreciable so due to this what is experience what we are experiencing that i am currently doing two transaction where people are actually talking about an asset purchase transaction rather than a slum sale because at least the buyer is certain that if the transaction is undertaken in an asset purchase scenario it will be able to record the price that it is paying for the respective asset and claim tax depreciation thereon which is not possible or which may not be possible in a slum sale scenario while asset purchase could be more cleaner from a tax depreciation angle one also need to remember that asset purchase transaction would attract gst in india although such gst can be claimed as input tax credit by the buyer one need to actually factor the time it would take for the buyer to utilize the input tax credit so for example if 100 is the gst which is paid on the purchase price for the asset purchase transaction one has to factor that post acquisition buyer will be able to utilize this 100 rupee of input tax credit over what period of time so for example if it takes 12 months then buyer has to actually factor a 12 month time value of money for utilizing this input tax credit to decide what actually makes sense from a transaction perspective from the buyer in the hands of the buyer the next is as i said the important would be the stamp duty uh, and as i said in india stamp duty varies from state to state uh, stamp duty on purchase of share is very minimal however in case of slum sale it could be very high uh, as compared to uh, for example an asset purchase or a share purchase transaction in case of slum sale so if i talk about state of maharashtra where mumbai uh, is located the on the slum sale the stamp duty would be 3% of the consideration and if it involves the slum acquisition involves in immobile property also then the stamp duty could be as high as 5 to 6% so stamp duty is another important aspect what we have seen is the tax losses of the target is also sometime uh, a key consideration because it is as like an asset the buyer post acquisition could actually take benefit of that now in case of uh, 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 purchase of shares in case of a say a closely held company or a private company if there is a 
change in voting power beyond 49%, then the tax losses of the target cannot be carried forward. However, the unabsorbed depreciation or the de loss pertaining to the unabsorbed depreciation can be carried forward. However, when we compare that with a, say, a slum sale or an asset purchase transaction, the tax losses will continue to remain with the target and the buyer cannot get benefit of the same. So, you know, if, if somebody looking at purchasing and protecting the tax losses, one will have to actually think about that I do a share purchase transaction, but at the same time, make sure that the 49% voting power related condition is not breached so that uh, one can take benefit of the carry forward of losses post acquisition as well. We have also seen that at times uh, the transaction is structured as a business or asset purchase mainly on account of exposure to possible contingent or hidden liabilities in the target. And this is actually a very important aspect. Uh, it goes beyond taxation. Although there will be hundreds of tax benefits on account of, say, a share purchase, parties would prefer to go for an asset purchase or a business purchase transaction if they believe that the target has a lot of contingent or hidden liabilities. Uh, in case of a share purchase, uh, as you know that once the shares are purchased, buyer would inherit the liabilities which are associated with the target. But that would not be the case if it is a slum sale or an asset purchase transaction. So, you know, if at all the transaction modalities require that share purchase is the only option, and at the same time the buyer believes that there could be a lot of hidden or contingent liabilities, then the option could be either have the indemnities incorporated in the transaction document or go for an appropriate insurance cover, or probably look at an escrow arrangement if that is uh, something possible to protect against any future liabilities getting materialized out of this contingent or hidden liabilities. Lastly, one would also need to evaluate the impact on various business licenses and arrangements uh, for deciding the acquisition structure. So again, very simply put, you know, if it is an asset purchase or a uh, business purchase transaction, the acquiring entity need to have those licenses in place in order to carry on the business post acquisition. Now, such licenses may or may not take time depending on the type of license which is there. But in case of share purchase transaction, the licenses will continue because the entity is continuing, the same entity is carrying on the business. Now, these are there, there are some other important uh, consideration to determine the mode of acquisition between a share purchase or asset purchase, the business or asset purchase transaction. However, when the target has multiple businesses or the buyer is interested in say only one of the businesses and not all the businesses, then the share purchase, purchase would not be an option. Conversely, when the buyer intends to acquire only a partial stake in the entity, then the share purchase would be the only option. So depending on, again on the deal parameters, one has to decide which option would make sense uh, and would meet the commercial objectives uh, from a transaction structure perspective. Now let's look at some of the other important consideration. Uh, now, it is also important to understand whether the payment of sale consideration is proposed entirely upfront or in a deferred manner, or is it linked to certain performance parameters in the future, which is typically called as earnout based consideration. Where the consideration is deferred, the seller from an Indian perspective would be required to pay tax upfront, although he may not have got money actually in its hand. So for example, out of say 100 rupee consideration, if 25 is deferred and that has to be paid say after two years of time, although it is actually will be received by the seller after two years, the seller will have to pay tax on the entire 100 on day one. And that is where the seller's discomfort may come into picture. However, uh, where the consideration is contingent, so the future consideration uh, in my example, 25 it is contingent and it is dependent on certain factors, certain criteria has to be achieved, then one can act, argue that such 25 should be taxed only after the completion of second year and not otherwise and not before. But again, if I talk about a cross-border transaction, the FEMA comes into picture and this FEMA says the non-resident purchasing shares can defer consideration only up to 25% and that too only for a period of 18 months. So this is again becomes one of the key factors to be kept in mind while deciding the transaction modalities. The next would be whether the transaction contemplates a swap of shares. That is, for example, the buyer issues its own shares to acquire shares from the say a resident Indian shareholders of the target and in turn issue its own shares to the shareholders. Now, this type of transaction would require prior approval. It is not permitted under automatic route from an Indian foreign exchange regulation perspective. 
another consideration in cross border transaction is the jurisdiction through which the acquisition should take place uh, depending on the tax treaty between india and the other jurisdiction as well as the existing structure of the acquirer uh, coupled with the expected flow of future stream of income from the indian target the jurisdiction could be decided to improve the tax efficiency on such future stream of income i have a separate slide dealing with this aspect so we'll talk about this more at that particular point in time lastly the manner of funding the acquisition is also important factor that need to be kept in mind before finalizing the acquisition structure so for example where a non resident buyer is looking at funding the share acquisition with local borrowing from within india the same is not allowed at the same time if uh, the the buyer is looking at taking borrowing outside india by leveraging the assets of the indian entity then again one will have to look at the fema and most likely it will require a prior approval so these are some of the acquisition consideration which i wanted to highlight now as i said depending on the deal parameters there could be many variables which can actually define the shape of the deal structure now let's turn to a scenario where a setup scenario so rather than we till now we spoke about the acquisition now let's look at if somebody is looking at setting up an entity in india then what could be the what are the different options which are possible from an indian standpoint company and the limited liability partnership these are two popular forms of legal entity and there are other structures also like setting up a branch office project office or liaison office each of these activities each of these type of entities are permitted only for certain specified type of activities and each requires prior approval from the regulator or the authorized banker now let's look at between a company and llp which act, which makes more sense uh, now there is no right or wrong answer to this and depending on your commercial objective one can select either a company or an llp structure so let's look at from a foreign investment perspective in case of company structure 100% foreign direct investment is permitted under automatic route uh, except certain sectors which i mentioned which requires either there are performance link conditions or there are caps which are prescribed now in case of llp limited liability partnership 100% foreign investment is allowed only in those activities where fdi is allowed under automatic route so for example retail activity uh, it won't be possible to set up uh, llp because there are performance link conditions and caps which are prescribed at the same time uh, say for example if somebody wants to set up an entity which is regulated by some other regulator say for example somebody is looking at setting up a non banking financial activities or lending activity in india then that gets governed by the reserve bank of india regulation and there there is no choice but to set up a company in india now let's talk about raising the foreign debt uh, that would be possible in a company structure of course it comes with conditions but in case of llp it is strictly prohibited so if if somebody is looking at debt raising debt from a foreign uh, uh, resources then that won't be possible in an llp structure but in a company structure certainly that is possible from a taxation perspective a company structure uh, depending on the type of uh, uh, you know the, the activity or the option that the company selects the corporate tax rate could range from 15 to 30 percent uh, in case of llp it would be a 30 percent tax rate but when it comes to distributing that profits to the shareholders or the owners of the entity in case of company structure there would be a further distribution tax say for example to the foreign shareholders that would be a tax of around 20 percent in india of course the tax rate could get reduced under tax treaty provisions but when it comes to llp post tax profits when it distributes to its partners or the owners there is no further tax payable in india so if you really look at in company there could be a lower tax rate when it comes to taxation of profits in the hands of company but there could be further tax when the upstreaming of those profits takes place in the hands of the shareholders but in case of partnership there could be higher tax rate on the profits itself but there is no further tax when the distribution takes place when it comes to statutory compliances a company will Uh, certainly will have uh, relatively higher compliances as, co as compared to an llp but let's look at the last and the most important factor where somebody is looking at raising money or from an external investor or exiting at some from point in time in future now there in my experience i have seen that the prospective buyers and investor and especially if they are private equity they would have more comfort by doing transaction with a company rather than an llp so these are the aspects that one has to keep in mind now let's look at what are the different modes as i said for llp uh, the only source of funding could be in the form of capital 
but for company there could be different forms in which the funding could take place uh Kithi, let's go to the next slide yeah so an indian company can be funded using different forms of instrument and each instrument will have certain advantages and a flexibility to structure the uh, transaction or the inflow of the fund as well as try and see if there could be a benefit in terms of repatriation of profits so for example let's take an example of equity when the equity funding is done it's a simpliciter that you know people put money towards the share capital and that's about it but at times uh, you know uh, in indian as per indian corporate law that could be different class of equities which are permitted so for example there could be a shareholder who does not want to be a part of the common pool of the equity share capital he wants to have certain preferences say for example he wants to have a liquidation preference or that shareholder wants to have a say a fixed rate of dividend now in that scenario a different class of equity capital could be looked at say for example a class b share that there are times when people look at compulsorily or convertible instrument like for example compulsorily convertible preference shares or compulsorily convertible debentures now the advantage of this type of instrument could be that uh, if somebody wants to give upside benefit or wants to have a downside protection depending on the valuation of the company in future then this preference uh, this convertible instrument can be used uh, for example uh, where an investor puts say for example a hundred dollar in an indian company by way of ccps and let's assume the fair value at the time of investment was us dollar one per share now typically in a scenario if one is to one conversion should take place then on conversion the shareholder would get 100 equity shares, uh, uh, as I said, on conversion of the CCPS. But the parties may agree that the, if the company achieves certain parameters, then the conversion would happen at, say, $2 per share. If And as, let's assume for a moment that the company actually achieves those parameters, then the investor would get only 50 shares upon conversion and not 100 shares. And this typically enables the promoters and the founder to dilute their stake less because they have performed and made, met the expectation of the investors. Similarly, where the, uh, and yeah, between, between uh, CCPS and CCD, let me highlight one more point is uh, on CCD, one can actually pay the interest. Uh, there could be a coupon which is attached to the uh, CCD and that interest becomes a tax deductible. And it also actually enables a regular repatriation of profits from the company or regular repat of cash from the company to the foreign shareholder uh, by way of interest. So again, between CCD, CCPS and CCD, depending on what is the objective of funding, one can choose between CCPS and CCD. At the same time, uh, there could be a pure for debt funding, which we call it as an external commercial borrowing or ECB funding that could be permitted but it comes with various riders. So there are various conditions as to who could be the eligible borrower, borrower who could be the eligible lender. There are end use restriction. That is the use, uh, the purpose for which the funds can be used. At the same time, there are minimum average maturity period or the repayment period, which are prescribed before that the money cannot be repaid. And at the same time, there is a overall cap on the interest, which is prescribed. So again, uh, but the advantage of Funding the Indian entity using a debt or a debt like instrument would be let's if there is a profit which gets accumulated in the Indian company and one wants to pay that to the parent company, then that can be paid by simply repaying the loan and there won't be any tax payable in India. So that could be the advantage which could be there. But yes, as I said, there are various conditions which needs to be complied with if a debt funding is required from a cross border. Lastly, I would also like to highlight a convertible note instrument. And this instrument is gaining popularity, especially when the funding is required to be done to a startup, which is recognized by the Indian regulators. Now, the beauty of this document uh, or the instrument is it remains a debt until it is converted. And there is an option available. So it is not a mandatory convertible instrument. There is an option available with the party who is funding uh, whether he wants to convert or he doesn't want to convert. And as I said, it is allowed in a startup, so it's a risky investment. So depending on how the entity has performed in future, the investor can decide whether he wants to convert or he wants to continue and treat it as a debt and get repaid upon the maturity. So these are the options from a funding perspective. Now let's look at how the taxation works when the, there is a repatriation of profits from India to the overseas parent entity 
from in different forms. So I have come, I have given a comparison of dividend interest, or there could be a management royalty fees payout, or a technical fees payout, or there could be a buyback, which can be considered. Now, in case of dividend, uh, as you know, worldwide, you know, dividend is not a tax deductible expense. But in case of interest and management royalty and uh, management fees, it would be a tax deductible expense. Of course, it would be always subject to certain aspects like, for example, in interest, it has to meet the theme cap regulations in India. At the same time, interest management fees or any type of cross-border payout other than dividend would need to meet the transfer pricing requirements in India. Uh, but the advantage of interest and management fees is it is a tax deductible expense, unlike a dividend payout. And therefore, there could be a tax saving which will flow to the Indian company if there is an interest or dividend, uh, if interest or management fees or royalty payout as compared to a dividend. As I said earlier, dividend is subject to a 20% tax withholding. Uh, the rate could reduce under the tax treaty. The interest could be subject to tax, uh, a withholding tax uh, between 5 to 40%. Again, the rate could reduce under the tax treaty. And management fees uh, or the royalty is subject to withholding tax of 10% in India. Uh, Valuation requirement, if you look at, there are no valuation requirement for dividend interest or management fees. The key requirement would be the transfer pricing. Now, let's compare this with a buyback scenario. As I said earlier, buyback is sometimes used for a repatriation of profits or giving exit to a particular set of shareholders. Now, uh, like in case of dividend, buyback can be undertaken only if the company has profits or security pay premium. Now, as you can see, the buyback is taxable at 20%. So the question comes, what is the advantage of doing the buyback? But let's look at the taxable base for that. In case of buyback, the taxation happens only on the difference between the buyback price and the issue price of the shares. So, for example, if the foreign investor had invested 100 into the Indian company and the share buyback is taking place at 110, then only on the difference of 10, that is 110 minus the 100, there would be a tax of 20% that the tax, uh, so the effective tax would be only two. Now let's compare this with dividend. In case of dividend, if the 110 is paid by way of dividend, then the tax on that would be 20% and that is approximately 22. So you can see the benefit that in case of buyback, it is only two, but in case of uh, dividend, it would be 22. Now let's look at an exit scenario. Uh, we looked at the upstreaming in the form of dividend interest or management fees or the buyback. But say, for example, somebody is looking at exiting from the Indian investment. Now, uh, there, uh, the seller, the non-resident seller would uh, have the capital gain. And in case of India, if you look at uh, the long-term capital gain, which is uh, in case of listed securities, somebody is holding shares and selling shares after one year of holding. In case of unlisted, it would be two years, that is 24 months holding period. If the shares are sold after this holding period, the tax rate would be 10%. In India, we call it as a long-term capital gains. Uh, of course, the methodology of computing capital gain differs both in case of listed and unlisted shares. This tax rate can further get further reduced uh, depending on the again the tax treaty. Now, let's look at how some of the jurisdiction fare when it comes to India investment, and let's look at how the taxation works in term uh, for different streams of income. Uh, I've given a comparison of Mauritius, Singapore, Netherlands, and the UAE. Uh, if you look at from a dividend perspective, the withholding in India because of the tax treaty, in case of Mauritius, uh, it gets reduced to 5%. Uh, in case of Singapore, it would be 10 and UAE, it would be higher, uh, around 12.5%. But in case of interest, it uh, the Mauritius is 7.5%, Singapore is 15%, and in case of UAE, it is 12.5%. So if you really look at, uh, you know, from a dividend perspective or the interest perspective, uh, Mauritius certainly scores over other jurisdictions, uh, but one has to also look at how the taxation will happen in the home jurisdiction. Uh, in case of Mauritius, uh, while the dividend would be tax-free, the interest would be subject to tax another 3%, so the effective tax would be 10.5%. In case of uh, Singapore, it would be 17% effective tax. Netherlands, it would be as high as 25%, but in case of UE, as we know, there is no tax, so the effective tax would be 12.5% only. So now if we compare the difference between Mauritius and Singapore, uh, UAE income in terms of interest, it's only 2%. In case of exit uh, taxation, that is gains, mostly most of the tax treaties of India have been amended while the, and therefore the taxation would happen in India at the rate of 10% if it is a, a long-term capital gain, what we discussed. 
Uh, however, there is a slight advantage uh, for the Netherlands. If the Netherlands entity sells shares of in India to a non-Indian person, then it will still not be subject to tax in India. Uh, uh, so, uh, Sundarji, I've got a comment that uh, these, I think so, it was to end at 7 p.m. So, uh, should I continue? I may take another 15, 20 minutes. Um, Nitezi, I think if we can wrap up in another five minutes, uh, then that will be better and we can take a few questions from the members okay. that will be i think better this is sure. what i'm thinking yeah sure sure thank you so yeah uh, so Kipti, let's go to the case study for inbound yeah so this is one case study that i would like to highlight uh, so a foreign investor was looking at investing uh, is already holding a 50 percent stake in indian entity and balance 50 percent was held by the indian partner now indian entity was in need of funds uh, uh, so the investor, foreign investor said that, yes, I would like to contribute to the uh, Indian JV, but at the same time, uh, if you achieve certain parameters, then I'm fine with, I don't want this money back and we can continue with a 50-50% stake. But if you don't achieve certain parameters within the given time frame, then I need to increase my stake in the Indian JV from 50 to 60%. Now here, uh, uh, the solution that was provided was using a convertible instrument in such a manner that either a CCPS or CCD is invested into the Indian company. And if the parameters are achieved, then of course what happens, the CCD or CCPS gets converted into class B shares, which does not have a, say a voting. It only has certain preferences, say for example, the liquidation preference. But if the parameters are not achieved, then the CCD or CCPS gets converted into the higher stake of 60% for the foreign investors. Now, uh, in interest of time, uh, uh, Kirti, let's go to the outbound structures. Uh, yeah, from an outbound perspective, uh, India also allows resident Indians to make outbound investments. Uh, and there are different routes uh, wherein the Indian resident can make investment either as a portfolio investment or uh, to carry on the business activities itself. Uh, broadly put it uh, as an Indian resident, if I want to in invest and as an individual, then there is a cap of US dollar 250,000 per financial year that I can invest. And if there are uh, uh, a company which would like to carry on the business abroad, uh, then uh, a 400% net worth cap, which is prescribed for the Indian entity to make investments abroad. Uh, so that's the broad summation of the outbound. Now let's go to an outbound case study yeah, so uh, here the situation was Indian entity was looking at making acquisition in Africa, uh, one of the African countries, and it was in the mining sector. Uh, now, uh, the key requirement was the repatriation should be permitted in a tax efficient manner once the profits are there from the African entity. Uh, so the choice was Indian entity makes direct investment into the overseas entity or it uses an SPV or a hold co jurisdiction. Uh, the uh, uh, you know, quickly, if India entity, uh, if the African entity makes profit, there was a withholding of seven and a half percent, and India entity was to make pay tax on that dividend as well. But the choice, uh, the, uh, the the structure that was suggested and recommended was to use a Dubai Hold Co. The reason was between the African and the Dubai company, there was no withholding tax on the dividend payout. And as you know, when the Dubai company in turn uh, distributes profit to India company, there is no withholding tax in Dubai as well. Apart from this, there were certain other considerations like. The family had certain setup uh, and close relatives were willing to move to Dubai. And what Mehul earlier mentioned about uh, a substance requirement that was possible to achieve by using a Dubai Hold Co. At the same time, uh, what we understood from the lawyers that the Dubai has good uh, network of the IPPA, that is Investment Promotion and Protection Agreements with the African nation. So these were the drivers why uh, an African uh, investment was rooted through the Dubai. Of course, with adequate care, that enough substance is available in the Dubai entity. Uh, so that's the summation. And I'll just go to the last slide and I'll take a minute on that. So as Mehul also mentioned in the earlier presentation, uh, it is not an easy ride. Uh, any transaction structure requires a careful thinking. There are anti avoidance rules. There is needs to be a commercial substance and the, the commercial rational and the substance requirement global minimum tax that Mehul spoke about, that is also a determinative factor. There are place of effective management rule, which is something similar to a CFC, that is a control foreign corporation that 
we will mention and it is for the indian companies if they have outside india investment and those entities does not have enough substance or those entities are being controlled and effectively managed from india then those entities could be subject to tax in india uh, and lastly if somebody is looking at having a whole co structure then one also has to factor the cost of maintaining and setting up that entity and the cost of creating substance in that entity so with that uh, in interest of time i will end here and would be happy to take questions uh, on my presentation thank you thank you very much uh, ca nitesh ji mehta for your easily understandable presentation on this mna and i think uh, i hope you will also share your presentation with us so that we can uh, send it to our members certainly i will do that yeah thank you very much now i request our excom member ca jay prakash agarwal to manage and moderate q and a over to you jay thank you ji sir beautiful presentation nitesh ji i loved your presentation and it was precise tax is not mna is not easy i mean lot of text lot of uh, understanding required but still you try to maintain the flow with examples and other stuffs thank you for that i normally have a habit of taking things more simplified so for me when i say merger i always say marriage so merger is something equal equal to marriage in marriage two people's understanding is required <laughs> once they understand then marriage is called successful right similarly for merger what is that key point which you think is required like for marriage i say understanding between the two for two entities which is getting merged what is the key point which you think is important and so you hit the nail jay uh, uh, you know you mentioned about the marriage uh, and for any merger transaction it requires meeting of the minds of the people because is this these like two unknowns are coming together correct and they would like to create something for the benefit of both of them so certainly meeting of the mind is very important and that's where uh, if you really look at the process which i described for the transaction the first step is deciding the commercial parameters uh, of the transaction and when when i say commercial parameters uh, you know it does, it's not only the deal parameters there are aspects like how the business will be done in future what would be the business projections for the future who will manage what how the business is will expand if at all there is an expansion required so all those aspects are very important so it is like a pre prenup agreement that nowadays you know people do it it is something similar to that perfect i love that understanding is required for businesses as well if they want to merge them we'll go with the first question i can see one raised hand but one of your close friend again i mean mehul saw him i can see the smile on the face when he come came on board similarly i will see the same face a smile on your face when he comes there on the screen a uh, old friend for of yours wants to ask a question i can see that teeth there with the smile asis ji please go ahead with your question and keep a very quick one vitesh uh, with uh, ppt and poem and gar what do you see the future of uh, tax mergers in india there so, are so many things happening now with pt and mli and mli overrides with all this uh, what we have been i've been hearing recently hearing there will be two mli overrides again because of digital tax so yes. whether mergers in india will still be as uh, easy or it will become more complicated so yeah so ashish good question and i know from where you are coming uh, uh, but certainly so i i think so uh, i always believe uh, and i still believe that uh, tax is just a consequence of any transaction uh the key would be the commercial parameters and as as i said uh, you know uh, whatever i've heard from the market by talking to the people india is going to be in the spotlight for the next decade at least on the mna transactions yes the structuring the transaction i would say would become more complex uh, there would be a need to think more especially when people are uh, thinking about coming or making investment using certain tax friendly jurisdictions that is where the the substance requirement would come into picture and more thought will require to be given to decide whether to use those kind of structures or there is a different requirement which is there uh, so rather than like for example you know global minimum tax rate if the global minimum tax rate comes into picture uh, i am not too sure whether having or routing jurisdiction to certain tax friendly jurisdiction is going to make or going to be of interest uh, any longer uh, in future because if anyway you have to pay tax might as well keep the structure simple so that it doesn't get questioned by the tax authorities so i would say uh, to answer your question in one line the transaction will happen yes the, some more thinking will be required 
and probably the use of so called tax haven or the tax territory jurisdiction uh, would could reduce going forward right thank you very much for that uh, nitesh you have seen kbc right yes. so now you will hear a voice uh, he is not on the video so hardik sir please go ahead with your question thank you thank you jai sir uh, thanks nitesh sir for such a detailed presentation just to uh, thank you uh, in more uh, i want to thank you more because it was just a kind of a recap of what we learned during our internship uh, in india a recap on fema and tax provisions and and it very well fits with the mna uh, i had one question and uh, that was primarily with respect to ccps ccps and ccds and as you rightly mentioned there is there is very thin line of difference and it's primarily driven by the commercial objective of the deal makers uh, but from an indian company perspective uh, i i understand that there are provisions in india which 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 prevents indian company to get a deduction on interest for more than 30% of the ebitda uh, and and such an un, uh, undeductible interest is allowed to be carried forward uh, similar to unabsorbed depreciation so the question was that is is it fair to say that ccds are more beneficial from a company perspective because one they get an upfront deduction or uh, that that's an advantage and secondly this uh, i understand that the that the carry forward interest which is not allowed as a deduction or the un, unabsorbed interest if i can say can be carried forward over a period of 8 years even if there is a change in the shareholding for for more than 50% of the of the indian target yeah so uh, hardik your understanding of indian law is certainly good i would say uh, you you i think so your question answers uh, you know uh, itself uh, certainly uh, if the intention is to have a regular payout uh, to a shareholder who is putting money in the form of say ccd uh, uh, i mean regular payout in the form of interest to a shareholder on the investment or funds which are put into the indian company ccd is certainly a better option uh, because as i said irrespective of profit uh, the uh, amounts can be paid the only thing is uh, you know in certain sectors like for example infrastructure or heavy gestation or high gestation period sectors ccd may not be or a ccd with a good uh, good um, uh, percentage of coupon may not be the right structure because what will happen the interest will keep on accruing uh and at the same time it will be taxed in the hands of the recipient uh but the benefit of that will come to the entity only in future once it starts making the profit at the same time if indian entity is entitled to certain tax holiday again structuring the transaction by way of interest may not give it any tax benefits so to that extent uh, i would add to what you mentioned already on uh, on in the question but yes broadly if somebody is looking at getting a regular stream of income now from the its investment ccd could be an option certainly thank, thank you. you thank you that that answers very well last question of the day not the least one coming from a senior profession from our chapter akhil ji please go ahead with your question again you will hear the voice if you can uh, show, show the video then you know participants uh, i mean i think uh, percentage will be more happy uh, i requested akhil ji but yeah, i think yeah. he <laughs> want to come online yeah no problem what no is your question sir yeah uh, I, I, i am not putting my video on because i am not presentable so i guess uh, that's the only reason uh nitesh ji thank you so much for a lovely presentation i probably missed out a few say few comments from you i wonder if you have covered this but my question relates to if you could cover uh, joint ventures visa so sir how, how do you distinguish Uh, first thing the voice is breaking but i could understand joint venture something nitesh you were able to pick the question then you can go ahead yeah, so, hello so if i if i heard akhil ji your hello. question was uh, yeah if i heard akhil ji your question was about a joint venture versus a subsidiary in an outbound transaction uh, or outbound structure from india so how do i distinguish between a joint venture and a subsidiary uh, so uh, typically put uh, a subsidiary would be somewhere Uh, where you have a say a hundred percent stake from an Indian perspective, because the words used in the regulations are wholly on subsidiary. And in case of uh, a joint venture, so if you have a stake of say, uh, a there is no definition as such, but generally it is believed that any stake between say uh, more than ten percent to 
uh, 99% or 99.9999% that should get categorized as a joint venture. So that is how the distinction is done from an Indian regulation perspective. But so far as the foreign investment norms go, goes, uh, that are same for both, be it a joint venture or a subsidiary, which is set up by an Indian party. Thank you. Thanks a lot. I think I will be satisfied. That is called experience. Okay. Between the lines. She read okay. All right. two words, JV, subsidiary. Yeah. Yeah. Thank, thank you. Uh, I am done. Uh, thank you, Nitesh ji. That was informative presentation. That topics were heavy for both of you, for you and Mehul. We could not complete the slides. We overshooted it, but it was really worth it. With these words, Harikiran ji, back to you. Yeah, so uh, before that, uh, uh, you know, as I said, uh, this presentation will be available and uh, it has my contact details. Uh, if any of you would like to have further clarification, do drop in a line or maybe uh, I'm a call away also. My mobile number is also given. Uh, so please feel free to reach out and would be happy to share my thoughts on your queries. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, CA Nitesh ji, for your excellent presentation and Q&A session as well. Now we are going to present a certificate of appreciation, sir, on behalf of the ICI Dubai chapter. I request Johan to share the certificate. The certificate is coming. Uh, now it will be displayed in a second. And we will also share this certificate over thank email you to you. Thank you very much. Thanks for the opportunity again. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, sir. And I also thank our XCO member, CA Jayaprakas Agarwal, uh, to moderate the Q&A with uh, CA Nitesh Mehta. Now we have reached to the last part of our today's virtual conference. I'll do the formal vote of thanks. First of all, I would like to thank our chief guest, Mr. Abdul Aziz Bukhatir, who has been actually sitting till now, I mean, uh, since the beginning of the uh, webinar. Thank you very much, sir. And I would li also like to thank our speaker, CA Mehul Sa and CA Nitesh Mehta for addressing our members today. And uh, would like to thank CA James Matthew for sharing his experience as a sponsor. And I also like to thank our managing committee for all their wholehearted efforts and especially to our XCOM member members, CA Jayapragas Agarwal and Manoharan Pallarichal. And I also like to thank Joan for playing the sponsor's video and sharing the certificate of appreciation during this webinar. Now I would like to thank our sponsors who have always supported us and still supporting during these tough times. Our principal sponsors, Telly, Lulu, and Danube Group, our platinum sponsors, UHY James, IFCO, and HLB Hemp. I also thank our media partner, Khalistans, institutional partner, Delhi Private School, and banking partner, Bank of Baroda. And many thanks to all of you, friends, for your active participation in this virtual conference. Uh, stay safe and stay connected. Jeff, please unmute all the members so that we can greet each other and uh, yeah. say good night. I have yes. one request to all the members. Uh, you know, we would appreciate if members can uh, at least introduce some of the sponsors for the annual conference, uh, only for the event sponsors. So I understand that we are getting lots of response, but you know, I mean, uh, we have artists coming in, we have Coca Cola Arena, and uh, there are so many uh, things are there. So, uh, I mean, we appreciate, uh, you know, any members who want to connect with the sponsor or their companies wish to sponsor the annual uh, conference, appreciate. Thank, Thank you. Chairman. Thank you, Chairman, sir. We have the powers now. Everyone has the power to unmute. So, anyone who wants to contribute, anyone who wants to give a feedback, wants to say, please call us for the uh, contributions on sponsorships, you are free. You can unmute yourself and come on online. I can see few faces there, few family family faces. Asis ji is there. Sir, koi bhi unmute kar sakta apne aapko. Everyone has the power to unmute. I think uh, now now that we are already running actually 30 minutes okay. late. So everybody is already in the mode of exit. So anyway, thank you very much and good night. Now I will end the meeting. Thank, thank you. you all. Thank, thank you. you. Stay safe. Thank you. Thank you. Take care. Shukran and, sir. Shukran thank, sir. You. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you very thank much. You. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.